Max. Good day and welcome to the Max Healthcare Institute Limited Earnings Conference Call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchdown phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Suraj Digavlikar from CDR India. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you, Raman. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us on Max Healthcare Q2 and H1 FY24 earnings conference call. We have with us Mr. Abhay Sol, Chairman and Managing Director, Mr. Yogesh Sareen, Senior Director and Chief Financial Officer, and Mr. Keshav Gupta, Senior Director of Growth, M&A, and Business Planning. We will begin the call with opening remarks from the management, following which we will have the forum open for an interactive Q&A session. Before we start, I would like to point out that some statement made in today's call may be forward-looking in nature, and a disclaimer to this effect has been included in the upcoming presentation shared with you earlier. I would now like to invite Abhay to make his opening remarks. A very good morning to everyone. We are pleased to welcome you to Max Healthcare's earnings call for the second quarter and first half of fiscal year 2024. Let me start by stating that our performance in the first half of the fiscal year has set a commendable precedent for us to follow in the latter half. We recorded a year-on-year -year increase of 17% in network revenue and 20% in EBITDA in H1, while Q2 turned out to be the 12th consecutive quarter of year-on-year -year growth. Our Q2 performance this year largely mirrored our quarter-on-quarter -quarter performance last year, alluding to the steady state of our operations as well as secular demand for quality healthcare services. Further, our granular focus on execution and capital allocation, as is evident from our pre-tax ROC of 38.3% in quarter two, we are well poised for the next leg of growth that is set to come from planned capacity expansion as well as inorganic opportunities. On that note, we are happy to share that the developer of an upcoming hospital in Dwarka has applied for the occupancy certificate, which is a significant uh, milestone, is actually the final milestone, and we expect to commission the same in the fourth quarter of the current year. Moreover, our most recent brownfield expansion, Max Shalimar Bath, has reported an overall average occupancy of 78% on a year-on-year -year revenue and EBITDA growth of 41% and 48% respectively in the second quarter. On the clinical front, we have signed a memorandum of understanding with Intuitive Surgical, the US-based pioneer of robotic surgical systems to establish Southeast Asia's first total program observation center located at our Max Sakhez facility. The center is expected to have positive impact on both India and Southeast Asia's surgical healthcare ecosystem by enabling healthcare professionals to drive advancements in patient care using robot, robotic assisted surgery and elevate surgical healthcare standards in the region. Now, moving on to the highlights of our second quarter performance, occupied bed days grew by 3% year on year and 5% quarter on quarter reflecting an average occupancy of 77% for the quarter, 93% of the year-on-year, -year, and 118% of the quarter-on-quarter -quarter increase in occupied bed days was driven by preferred cash channels, preferred channels, which is cash, insurance, and TPA, and international. With increase in occupied bed days and marginal drop in ALOS, the inpatient discharges were up by 7% year-on-year. Even OP volumes exhibited a strong growth of 14% year on year and 4% quarter on quarter. Institutional bed shares trended 27.3% compared to 27.9% last year and 29.7% in quarter one this year. However, after excluding Max Shalimar Bars, the most recent expansion, the overall institutional bed shares stood at 25.4% during the second quarter. Average revenue per occupied bed for the quarter, quarter stood at 74,600, growing by 13% year on year and remaining flat quarter on quarter due to seasonality. Year on year improvement was witnessed across all specialities, with oncology being the key driver. 
Network gross revenue was 1827 crores compared to 1567 crores in the second quarter last year and 1719 crores in the previous quarter. This reflects an increase of 17% year on year led by growth in ARPA and occupied bed days. Quarter on quarter growth of 6% is mainly driven by increase in OBDs, occupied bed days. Revenue from international business again grew significantly by 25% year on year and 11% quarter on quarter, accounting for now around 9% of the total revenue from our hospitals. During the quarter, we have operationalized company owned patient assistance centers in Nepal, while all formalities for the Bangladesh center have been completed. We expect to operationalize this center shortly. This is in spite of the Afghanistan business, which was 12% of our total international business, is down to zero. Direct costs were lower quarter on quarter due to increase in medical patients attributable to seasonal vector borne diseases. On the indirect cost side, while the overall percentage was lower, there was an increase in absolute costs, primarily due to marketing costs for international channels and seasonal increase in power consumption. Network operating EBITDA stood at 497 crores, just below the magic mark of 500, reflecting growth of 21% year on year and 14% quarter on quarter. Accordingly, the operating margin increased to 28.7% versus 27.7% in the Q2 last year and 26.8% in the previous quarter. Most importantly, annualized EBITDA per bed rose to 75 lakhs yet again our highest ever, clocking a growth of 17% year on year and 7% quarter on quarter. Profit after tax was 338 crores versus 267 crores in Q2 last year and 291 crores in the previous quarter on a like-to-like -like basis. The year on year improvement of 26% was primarily attributable to flow through of improved EBITDA and lower finance costs. Free cash flow from operations was significantly higher this quarter at 456 crores, of which 90 crores was deployed towards ongoing capacity expansion projects. Net cash position improved to 1303 crores at the end of September 2023, compared to net cash of 42 crores same time last year. Continuing efforts to support the local communities, we treated approximately 39,000 patients in OPD and 1,300 patients in IPD from economically weaker sections free of charge. Both our strategic business units continued to trade strongly on the growth trajectory. Max at home reported a top line of 42 crores, reflecting a growth of 23% year on year and 8% quarter on quarter. We continue to receive good feedback for our services and the same is reflected in the SBU revenue growth. Max Lab, the non-captive pathology vertical, offers its services in 36 cities and now has an operational network of over 1,000 collection centers and active partners. This SBU reported a gross revenue of rupees 39 crore, reflecting a like-to-like -like growth of 32% year-on-year and 15% quarter-on-quarter. Now coming to the status on the upcoming expansion projects, as most of you know, 122 beds of Shalimar Bagh have been operationalized at the start of this financial year. And as mentioned earlier, the hospital reported an average occupancy of 78% for the quarter. For 300 beds at Dwarka, application for OC, which is occupancy certificate, has been submitted in October end. Majority of the interior works have been completed. And some of it is just being finished as we speak. We expect to commission the hospital in later half of Q4 subject to receipt of occupation certificate by the developer. Three hundred and twenty-nine beds at Nanavati. Excavation and raft work are complete. Steel fabrication up to the ground level and slab work have also been completed. Ground level structure is expected to be completed in the current quarter and the project continues to be on schedule. For 300 beds at sector 56 Gurgaon in phase 1, the D wall has been completed and the site excavation is almost done. The EPC contractor is already on board and design and development is under process. TDR approval for additional 0.5 FAR has been received and the project is on schedule.
490 beds at Mohali. The D wall is completed and excavation work is underway. All statutory approvals to start the construction have been received and the project is largely on time. Well, almost entirely on time. The EPC contractor has been mobilized and the design development is in progress. The 350 beds at Max Mart in Saket, which had seen some delays initially, we have now initiated the process of transplanting the trees that uh, 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 permission has taken some time to come, which are now, this has been on the critical path, but now uh, the project is back on schedule and work should start by December, current year. For 300 beds at Vikram, at the uh, Saket complex, environmental trails have been received and the submission of drawings to the Municipal Corporation of Delhi is in process. For 250 beds at Patapargan, drawings have been submitted to the Municipal Corporation of Delhi and the application for environment clearance has been submitted. So all the other projects are on schedule, there is no delay as such. And finally, coming to the overview of the complete performance in the first half of this financial year, the network lost revenue stood at 3,546 crore, reflecting a growth of 17% year-on-year. -year. Network operating EBITDA grew by 20% year-on-year to 933 crore. Increased ARPOP improved case mix and augmentation of network bed capacity by 130 beds, resulted in margin expansion to 27.8% while EBITDA per bed grew by 15% to 72.8 lakhs per bed. In the first half, we generated rupees 697 crores of free cash flow from operations after interest, tax, working capital changes, and routine capex, of which 128 crores was deployed towards ongoing expansion projects. With this, we open the floor for Q&A. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask the question may press star and 1 on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and 2. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Anyone who wishes to ask the question may press star and 1 at this time. The first question is from the line of Damyanti Karai from HSBC. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, you continue to see progress in uh, reducing bed share to institutional patients. So a uh, few quarters back, you had uh, given an uh, indication that you would like to bring it down to the industry level. Uh, but uh, with Shalima Bagh, I guess uh, you have taken all, uh, more institutional uh, bed to ramp up occupancy, etc. So do you uh, still uh, target to bring it down to, say, industry average and when it will uh, likely happen? I mean, there is no industry level, so to say. Uh, you know, I mean, there's no classified industry level. I think it's highly sort of uh, changes between metros and non-metros. Uh, you have more PSUs, headquarters, etc. out of places like Delhi and CR, so you have a larger sort of... Uh, Importance of that, uh, larger amount of business is coming through. Now, uh, two, three things have happened. One is uh, apples to apples from 29.7%, which come down to about 25% uh, in the current quarter. Second is that it's on an increased capacity, including uh, Shalimar Bagh, which has happened. Uh, thirdly, certain rates have moved up, uh, in which, uh, because of, in CDHS, and we're expecting certain other rates on institutional business to move up in the current quarter because of which little bit you would have taken the foot of the accelerator. And uh, finally, even within, uh, you know, the, the institutional business, there's been a churn in the sort of specialities we are catering to and the ones we are not catering to. And all of it sort of comes down and plays out in your higher EBITDA. So what you're seeing is, although uh, because of the overall capacity constraints that we have, uh, your occupancy has moved up by only perhaps 3% year on year, but there's been a churn of about 3 to 4% year on year also uh, within the patient, in, within the payer mix. And all of that is then translated into a higher percentage margin as well as uh, EBITDA per bed. Um, 
So to say, I mean, uh, apples for apples, the same inventory going forward will be coming down as far as uh, institutional business is concerned. But to your point, as you rightly, rightly mentioned, as in when you have new capacities coming, those capacities initially will have increased in institutional business. So in percentage terms, it may move up, but in uh, uh, or remain stagnant just when those capacities come in. But I think overall, it still translates to your better better market. Okay. Okay. So. Uh you mentioned like uh, just, in just to sort of complete that point. Yeah. In, uh, you may have seen because of Shalimar Bagh, new capacity coming in, the institutional business sort of uh, moves up. But if you actually see the EBITDA coming from uh, those incremental beds, in spite of uh, uh, back, uh, sorry, basis this increase in institutional business is yet 40% margin. Okay, uh, so uh, that means obviously you are getting much uh, better realization from these set of patients also. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, wage, wage hike in CJHS could be one of the region uh, which which might be contributing and then obviously speciality mix. Just, uh, not, 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 not that, there is a reality because of the operational efficiencies that you have. You have huge operating leverage in the new beds. You don't have the fixed cost to set up. So what happens is even the lower mix Right? I mean, the lower payer mix okay, becomes more viable and more and more viable even on the new sort of bed. Because your operating cost is very low on the incremental. Okay, so it's primarily driven by efficiency, as you mentioned. Like, you, you have uh, better absorbed the overheads there. That is uh, resulting in these kind of that's numbers. Right, that's right. Okay. And uh, just a clarification you mentioned uh, there has been a bit of hike on the CGHS patient also. So right now, like, what is the difference between that uh, price channel and then uh, the normal cash and others, like, very broadly, like, what is that? Yeah. So typically, if you take the ARPA of the two channels, they will be, so the, so the CTI channel, the preferred channel is 85% higher than the PS channel. Oh, 100% higher. Yeah. No, 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 85% higher. Yeah. 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 Eighty. Uh, so the preferred channel is eighty-five percent uh, better yeah, ARPA than the. So if your PSU ARPA is hundred, this will be hundred eighty-five. Okay, hundred and hundred. Okay, my uh, yeah. last question is uh, your uh, difference between gross revenues and uh, net revenues, which you go for uh, performer financials. That's primarily driven by uh, what you pay for EWS uh, patients, right? Yeah. So. And, that's right. Uh, yeah. Largely, largely that's the that number, yeah. Yeah, and I'm seeing uh, that number has broadly remained uh, somewhere like 5% uh, of gross right. revenues. So uh, should we assume similar uh, numbers to trend, even if, like, say, we are uh, commissioning new facilities ahead and then according to government uh, rules, we have to uh, allocate some bet for the EWS? No, the uh, Vata may not have any EWS subdivision. It does not have. Uh, so, does not have. Mumbai uh, will have and others will have. I mean, uh, Gurgaon won't have. Okay. So, Dwarka and Gurgaon does not have? Dwarka and Gurgaon, Dwarka and Mohali. And Mohali yeah. All others will have. Okay. Okay. Thank so you. Twenty two hundred additional beds. Mm -hmm. I think between these you have uh, 200 in Mohali, 300 in... Uh, 1,000 beds. 1,000 beds will not have. Balance 2,200 will have. Sorry, balance 1,200 will have. Approximately 1,200 beds will be uh, utilized and then others don't have such requirement. Yeah, so let's say we have 2,200 beds further coming up. Mm -hmm. 2,700 beds will be further coming out of which 1,000 beds will not have any EWS obligation. And the balance 1,700 will have the 10%, so let's say about 170 beds out of 2,700 beds. Okay, got it. Thank you. And all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kunal Ganesha from Macquarie. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, sir. First on the uh, housekeeping question, on the uh, international patient bed share, what was that for the quarter? Yeah, so that'll be around 5%. 5% only. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know the R of is higher, so that's how it, now we, the revenue share goes up. So it's, I mean, the death experience five and a half percent. Five and a half percent, okay. Okay, so then uh, probably the pricing, et cetera, kind of more or less has remained same. 
Okay, thanks for that. And secondly, when I look at our specialty mix, uh, oncology therapy, if I see, has been uh, growing at almost 2x the overall revenue growth, uh, you know, at least for the last two quarters. And even if I look at a longer term trend, for the last uh, nine quarters in a row, it has grown faster than our overall revenue growth. So what are we doing differently there? Uh, and, uh, you know, is it a market uh, growth or... Yeah, I think overall growth is 17%. This is about 26-28%. Not exactly double. But uh, there's been a focus on oncology and uh, we've also seen a larger burden of the disease sort of this thing playing out. We've also had a uh, focus on robotics, etc. And uh, as we are moving up the value chain, what we're seeing is more and more people are choosing uh, more, uh, more sort of uh, better technology. Okay. And then and, and, uh, also seeing, as you're seeing more and more uh, population of insurance, mm -hmm. then people tend to sort of uh, for higher end uh, things, etc., do less of window shopping. They go to more established uh, corporate hospitals and brands. So we are seeing more and more people for oncology and some of the other things, whereas they would have gone to smaller places earlier, now coming to larger hospitals. So insurance plays an important part. And so now also oncology tends to have higher entry barriers, right? So there's a lot of national card equipment, etc., bunkers, infrastructure, etc. So to that extent, you know, the patients do gravitate towards, you know, bigger players. Sure, sure. And and is it uh, possible to share the split of this 25% of revenue mix between, let's say, surgical and non-surgical? Because we have also have chemotherapy and radiotherapy included in this 25%, right? No, that's not a public number, so, but, but I think obviously a, a, a large part, I would say not the, so it will be a large part of this will be chemotherapy, right? But I would say it's a, it's a fair share of all three, radiation, you know, surgical and medical. Uh, now, we haven't publicly given that number, uh, so we won't publicly disclose the difference between the three. Sure. And and is it fair to say that oncology would be highly accredited to profitability for us? Yes. Now, yes, the oncology happens to have higher ARPA. Right? So to that extent, uh, yes, it will be higher profitability also. Sure, sure. And and, and second... Uh, it you know, at it. I mean, it also occupies more space. So, you know, there's also a return on capital and return on real estate over there. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So, so return on capital is also higher in your view, or does it require more space so it would more or less? In I think like return on capital is uh, it's uh, even even with the rest. Okay, okay, great. Thanks for that clarity. And secondly, on uh, I mean, you know, drivers of a strong ARPOC growth of around thirteen percent year on year uh, for the first half. If I kind of you know do some back calculation using the bed share and. Uh, revenue share, it seems that uh, CGHS ARPOB or institutional ARPOB would have at least gone up by around 20-25%. Is that a fair uh, number or I'm overestimating, underestimating? Just now that's right. I mean, the, the PSU ARPOB has gone up by 28%. 48% for the first half. 48% and why and why. And that's not because of pricing. Yeah, it's also because of the mix that's a mix change, which I was mentioning earlier. Mm -hmm. It's a change okay. in mix. It's not a change in price. The change in price will not even have a 14 crore sort of impact on your overall revenue. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. I have more questions. I'll get back. Thank you. Um, and, uh, Thank you. The next question is from the line of Dino Patir Parampil from Ilaya Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, good morning and uh, congrats on a great set of numbers. Um, just was one question on the expansion plans. Uh, for all the facilities, the greenfield facilities that are coming up over the next couple of years, so what's your internal target for a bit of break even in how many months or quarters? You know, 90, almost 90% of our expansion is brownfield. And uh, normally we see a bit of break even in a quarter or two, if not the first quarter itself. Now, the last experience was a bit, uh, again, a bit of break even. We were rating 40% margin within 40 days. Oh, so, your question was on Dreamfield facilities. I think on Dreamfield, uh, we do see 11, I think within the first 12 months, break even. That means 11 to 12 months should be the break even, a bit up. That's 10% of the total expansion is in that. Oh, 
Understood. So um, within a year for Greenfield and within a quarter for Brownfield. Okay. That is, yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nitin Nagarwal from Dam Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Abhi, uh, what, uh, can you just give us some numbers on what has been the ch increase in uh, discharges, out inpatient discharges of QQ and YOI? 7%. This is YOI. That's it. Q and Q increasing the matter simply because you know what medical patients, etc. <clears throat> So when you have more medical patients, you're discharging because you lost and lower discharging may be the same. Look at everything on a year on your basis, which is better service. Okay. And secondly, on the you know the seasonality part of it, uh, you know typically, uh, I mean, how should one think about seasonality in our business? Q2 obviously is bigger than Q1, and how should we, should we think about the rest of the year uh, with uh, with respect to Q2? No, Q, see, Q4 is the best quarter in a year. Q2 is the second best quarter. Q1 and Q3 are weak quarters. And that's seasonality in the business and happens every year. Typically, your H2 is better than H1. Okay. And, uh, and I guess given the way things are, that's, that's a trend we should follow even, uh, follow even this year for us. That's right. I mean, unless something disruptive happens, that's typically the secular trend in healthcare is H2 is better than H1. And uh, Q4 is peak, Q, uh, because of the burden of disease, etc. Also, your... Uh, uh, Q2 is uh, the sec uh, second best simply because you have the seasonality due to dengue and vector season. And Q1 and Q, you know, Q1 is weak because you just had increase in salaries and fixed costs, etc. on the 1st of April, so your margins are kind of squeezed. And um, yeah, Q3 uh, is the festival, it's festival season, which is the valley and all of that kind of stuff. And, and secondly, on your expansion plans, barring, uh, you know, the, beyond what we've already outlined so far, uh, how are we thinking about, uh, you know, expansion in a, we've got enough cash reserves on books now. Uh, yes. in, in, in terms of the inorganic growth opportunities which are there, uh, in, I mean, have you, how have you seen the landscape playing out? There have been a lot of private interest in the space, uh, which probably, uh, I don't know, uh, would have had its own, created own challenges for, for value buying. Uh, so how are you looking at uh, the inorganic growth opportunities outside of NCR? So I think there are quite a few. I think there were 20 or 60 that we are looking at, and uh, you know we've been busy at it. And hopefully in the near future, uh, very shortly, we should um, you know come up with some surprising stuff. But yeah, um, there's been a lot of uh, this thing on the. I mean, we maintain some fiscal dis discipline and uh, don't want to run fool's errands by the end of it. But uh, there are uh, quite a few amount of opportunities, both on the build side, partner side, on the asset light uh, you know, model, as well as uh, certain uh, acquisitions as well. So yeah, we intend to deploy this capital. Okay. And last one, on the Shalimar bank expansion that we did in Brownfield, what is the capacity utilization on that? 78% on, on the overall, on the overall, new and old combined. And when you would have put the new capacity, the older one would have been what, closer to 80% plus? The, 80 to 83%, yeah. Okay. 80%. And, and what, and just sort of reconfirming, re uh, on the incremental beds, we may be making right now 40% incremental margins. Yes, that's right, that's right. And, and how do you think? And within 40 days of opening those beds. Right, right. And uh, in your uh, assessment, uh, incremental brownfields that we're going to be putting out, uh, how should we even think about, you know, we did talk about the first quarter break-even, but uh, in terms of, uh, you know, is Shalimar bargain exception in the way it's played out, or this is going to be a template that's broadly going to get replicated across the new brown fields? Look, honestly, I think, you know, that's been a, what the Shalimar bag experience was, was the experience in uh, Vishali before that as well. Because, uh, I mean, theoretically, you're tapping into un-sort of uh, tap demand on your doorstep to start with. And then you have operating, you don't have any fixed, real fixed costs with the, uh, those incremental things. Theoretically, it should be, I mean, this should be the template. I mean, I don't see that changing. Oh, perfect. That's, that's inter interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ankur, as an individual investor. Please go ahead. Hello. Hi, Ankur. Hi. 
See, I think my question is partly answered in uh, one of the previous uh, uh, questions that was raised by one of the participants. Really, it was about the last two years. Uh, there's a bit of a concern that we haven't acquired any project uh, and added anything onto our already announced development pipeline. And obviously, we've been running an under-leverage balance sheet for a while now, and then now we've got all this cash accumulating. And you've talked about, uh, you know, acquisitions, M&A, and all of that. But, I mean, it's two years since we added anything. And uh, uh, on also on the greenfield side of things, uh, 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 are we looking at, you know, any greenfield projects that we want to add? And I know you keep saying, like, imminently that there should be some announcements. But, uh, you know, it also takes about, I think, if you add a new project, a greenfield project, about three, four years before it's operationalized. So if you can throw some light on all of these things, please. Yeah, I think you know there's always a tug of war between the desire to expand and uh, fiscal discipline. And you have one has to maintain that. Uh, you know, it's not uh, as if we haven't been this thing. We kiss uh, many frogs before we find the prince, and uh, you know we are at it. And uh, we are quite certain that uh, shortly we should be able to deploy. Do keep in mind it's not a huge amount of gas because even to construct a 500 bed hospital you require to take about a thousand crores, right? Uh, to acquire a, 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 a thousand bed, uh, a, a 500 bed hospital cost you another maybe thousand to fifteen to fifteen hundred crores. Um, so you know one or two acquisitions then you're done. So you know at one side we are sort of excited about the fact that we are accumulating cash, but we are also conscious of the fact that you know this amount of cash and even the ability to leverage is not going to take you very far. I mean, today transactions are available at uh, uh, 15 times, 16 times, let's say, EB to EBITDA. What that means is even at entry, uh, we'll be able to buy, even if I was to go and spend 5,000 crores, right? I mean, we can invest, what is the math on that, divided by 15? About 200 crores EBITDA? That's about 10% of my total EBITDA. So 300 crore EBITDA, that'll be 15% EBITDA. So I can increase my EBITDA by 15% by deploying 5,000 crores. And that would pretty much use up all my cash and my leverage ability. Okay. Right? Okay. So yeah. I think, you know, it's important to, while uh, we uh, uh, notice that there's uh, amount of cash which is being accumulated, do keep in mind it is a capital intensive sector one. And secondly, there are massive amount of opportunities in the sector yet. So if we want, uh, we need to accumulate the cash and spend it with the right amount of fiscal discipline at the right time. Yeah. Because it's money, but it's not that much money also. Yeah, and also like you know, um, like as the way we've been going, and it's about almost let's say 20% sort of beta growth, cash flow growth over the last couple of years, and going forward also it seems we're going to continue on that trajectory over the next four or five years. So then beyond that, to continue going at the 20% sort of rate, we'll also need to keep adding uh, the debt capacity at that sort of rate, right? So we need to have like this continuous development pipeline which keeps, you know, every year keeps adding projects year on year so that, you know, the growth continues for long duration. You, so I'm sure you guys are working on it, but just, uh, and you have, mentioned like you're looking at 20 cities. Uh, so, but there has been no like uh, actual project acquisition. So that was my only question, but yeah. No, but you're absolutely right. Just keep in mind two aspects, right? In the last two years, there's not been any significant capacity expansion. That's right. Yep. Yes, you're seeing a 20 odd percent increase in EBITDA. Yeah. In the next three to four years, you're going to have 25 to 2700 beds coming. You're increasing your capacity, 85 percent of it is through brownfield. That is almost like doubling your capacity over the next three to four years. Mm-hmm. Those are coming yep. on stream. So sh shouldn't that be giving you expansion for the next five or seven or ten years itself? And increasing your, given the fact that your break even is so short in these brown fields, okay, it will add a bunch of more cash flows for your this thing, which again all of it gets deployed and gives you further this thing. So look, I mean, I think there are three streams of uh, growth over here. One is your current uh, uh, bed capacity, which has been growing, has been uh, uh, growing uh, in terms of EBITDA. Okay, then all the expansions that are already been announced, which have already been underway, which we said are largely online. And the third is what you want to do with this cash. Mm -hmm. 
right? Yeah. So, I mean, it's an exponential three x strategy. It's not a strategy with a 15, 20 percent growth. I mean, if I was not to sort of uh, deploy this cash, give it all back as dividend, yet you will be doubling your capacity over the next two years, or oh, sorry, three to four years. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, I think uh, that's it. I mean, from my side, I understand where you're coming from. It's uh, and also it's clear, like as the cash flow keeps accruing over the next three four years, and they keep growing, you continue to uh, you know add on to your development pipeline, and you know continue this growth for long term. So that's it from my side, and uh, thank you, and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Tushar Manudhani from Motila Losal Financial Services. Please go ahead. So thanks for the opportunity. So just on the organic basis, uh, on EBITDA per bed, uh, while we've already, uh, I presume, we've optimized in terms of frequency uh, at the over level. So how do you think about you know, the levers for improving EBITDA per bed uh, for next two years, two three years? I think EBITDA per bed now, the first half has already happened, right? right? And you know your second half is usually marginally better than your first half and so on and so forth. I think for at least for the rest of the year, some sort of trajectory has been already articulated. So, 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 uh, so more from, let's say, beyond FI24, uh, how do you think about it? Sorry, more from? Beyond FI24, how to think about it in the sense, uh, uh, in the sense, we, uh, the case mix or the, the pair mix is also uh, have already taken good price hike on account of institutional patients. Uh, the insurance no, penetration. Price, no, no, it's not a price hike. Impact is only 14 crores. There's a 28 percent increase in RPOB, and that's really due to the clinical sort of this thing. Because you're moving into higher end procedures. We are distilling procedures. Right. Okay. The price okay. hike has been negligible, in fact. Yeah. Of the 28 percent, only 5 percent is the price hike impact. In the PSU segment, so in the PSU, like so, like uh, uh, you guys rightly pointed out, or 28 percent increase in our pop in PSU, only 5 percent is due to price hike. Okay. Right? No, I meant to ask that how much more can further be optimized, if not on price hike, but other levers, so as to you know drive the EBITDA bar there, uh, maybe in mid teens or more or less growth over the next two to three years. In a similar fashion, na, your, uh, uh, as your payer mix sort of starts uh, moving up on a particular trajectory, your clinical mix moves up on a particular trajectory, all of it flows to your EBITDA. Your, uh, uh, your uh, indirect cost is increasing by maybe 6 odd percent every year, 6 7 percent every year or whatever. So the <laughs> difference between your revenue increase, now you have to make an assumption of the revenue increase. The difference between that and the indirect cost increase is all flowing down effectively. Got it. Understood. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is on the line of Bansi from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Hi. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so I have one question, and this is on uh, the advancement of uh, robotics that we've seen in the overall healthcare space. So we've seen more and more specialties using uh, robotics and even the non-complex ones, um, you know, are making use of uh, robots. So in general, you know, where are we today in terms of, you know, uh, um, you know, surgeries which are getting done on robots and what's the scope here, you know, where it can go to? And also, you know, uh, will this be, uh, you know, I'm assuming this will be lucrative enough. So, you know, what is it in terms of, uh, uh, you know, RPOBs and, you know, margins, you know, how different they are, uh, you know, compared to our uh, traditional, uh, you know, surgery work? So I think first and foremost, uh, I think, uh, you know, although robotics has been around for some time, uh, over the last couple of years, there's been a sudden uptake of that and acceptability between doctors and patients both has been quite dramatic as far as robotics is concerned. I mean, to be honest, it surprised us also on the upside. I mean, like I mentioned earlier, our total number of robotic procedures have more than doubled in the last one year. And, uh, you know, it's been a pleasant surprise. Uh, most specialties now, if, you know, you get into this flywheel uh, uh, concept as the uh, acceptance sort of this thing. We are being pushed by many of our hospitals and many of the clinicians now, okay, to set up robots because then frankly it's become more and more viable. 
Uh, what happens is, it, of course, uh, it's at a higher cost compared to, uh, you know, laparoscopic or even for that matter, a general surgery for the same this thing. But, uh, and so it uh, leads to higher ARPOX. But uh, the contribution levels from uh, robotics are lower. Uh, and EBITDA in terms of margins are lower in percentage terms, although in value terms are higher. And this is something that uh, Banshee had previously mentioned with respect to both higher end air mix and clinical mix that you get lower percentage margin but higher value in terms of absolute EBITDA coming from this. Uh, you guys, what is that? Yeah, it also helps us in terms of reduction in allot, right? So EBITDA per bed is obviously better, uh, but in terms of margin, that, that may be probably you know, lower than the overall average. But a little difficult to right now sort of present a trajectory where do we see the growth happening and you know, will it continue yeah. to be 100% growth or will it repeat it down to 70 or 50%? But, uh, or will it increase from here? Got it. But the adoption has increased and in general, you know, it, it also improves your throughput, right? Within a particular that's right. uh, that's, specialty. That's right. That's, okay. right. that's right. And, you know, I mean, overall, it's a, uh, I mean, it's got all the sort of positives with it. Uh, and, uh, you know, as uh, public acceptability sort of increases, is this technology advanced, you know, uh, there are entry barriers in this. The smaller sort of places can't adopt it increasingly, and awareness increases. Then you see this move towards larger hospitals and more sophisticated healthcare systems. It's also better mental organs, good for patients. Yes. Got it. Thank you. That's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you. A reminder to our participants: please press star and one to ask a question. The next question is a follow-up question from the line of Kunal Damesha from Macquarie. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for the opportunity again, sir. So uh, one on Dwarka. Uh, so as we are kind of getting closer to the commissioning of the facility, uh, would have we like started hiring in terms of doctors for key specialties, uh, nurses, paramedical staff, or would it be more closer to the commissioning? So, so we started all of that, and I think we've... Uh... Um, or at least all the head of the program and functional sets are already in place and they've been in the system. Uh, as we speak, uh, uh, they are working in some of our other facilities. And uh, yeah, so we, I mean, as far as the, the soft power is concerned, the uh, uh, people are concerned, etc., all that is in line and schedule. So there, there's no lull on that. And there's enough availability and excitement around the facility from the clinician okay. side. And would it be more like a staggered hiring in terms of specialties or we would go with the full flex 300 bed operationalization on day one? Uh, no, no, you do about 150 odd beds, 164 beds we are doing, uh, to be precise, like you pointed out. So 164 day one. And as you require, you sort of open up more and more. Okay. And, and uh, one follow up on the uh, robotic surgery while you have alluded that it's good from the ARPOP perspective and the absolute beta perspective. Uh, but in a longer uh, term, uh, you know, if let's say even the uh, you know other hospitals also kind of start affording it, uh, you know, does not that does that bring them to the equal level in terms of surgical outcome, etc. And then you know, uh, the importance of brand or uh, you know surgeon's skill kind of get reduced. Do you see that happening? Not particularly. I think the market is growing. I mean, there's only those many players which can adopt robotics. It's also, it's also uh, you know, people have to be trained on it. You have to have availability of their talent uh, to be able to do this. So, you know, all of that will take time. But I think more and more before that, your market would have expanded. And when we've seen this, right, I mean, the, the, why robotics? As far as any technology is concerned, the larger players sort of adopted first, the smaller players adopted thereafter. Uh, the market uh, continues to expand. But I've never seen the larger players sort of market share go down because the smaller players have adopted the technology thereafter. I think you kind of increase the size of the market. All the smaller players also have a hand in increasing awareness for that product. Mm -hmm. Sure. And for us, is it uh, more like a KPEX model or is it more paper use model? You know, actually, we, uh, right, you asked, if we started this off with paper use, we could be quite unsure. But uh, we've uh, actually bought back or bought uh, more than 50% of the robots uh, recently because, you know, this kind of surprised us in any case. So, yeah, at, at this point in time, we have a hybrid simply because uh, we started off by paper use, but now we got into buying it back. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
So we got more than 50 percent of the robots that we have. Okay. And and return on capital is higher on. Uh, uh, of course, that's why we are buying. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Naisal Sarik from Native Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, my first question was on the you know overall industry trend. Are, are you seeing uh, uh, still there is a gap uh, between supply and demand growth, um, and, and do we see for the next uh, you know couple of years so there will be leverage to uh, continuously grow price and our form? How how are you seeing that? I am not seeing it over the next couple of years. I'm seeing it over the next few decades. I think uh, this is a multi-decadal opportunity. Uh, there is huge amount of underpenetration. Uh, you know, there's a massive, massive, massive gap between uh, uh, supply of quality healthcare and demand for quality healthcare, which is only increasing as we go by. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I mean, that's the reason. Uh, you know, it, and India perhaps offers this opportunity, which nowhere else, no other country, no other health system in the world does. I mean, you have uh, at one uh, uh, site you operate almost like a utility because you have the sort of uh, uh, it's inflation-free, it's insulated business. But at the other end, you also have this massive growth opportunity because of the I mean, just the sheer lack of uh, penetration or availability of uh, quality facilities. Uh, got it. And on the international patient side, you said around five, five and a half percent of your beds. Uh, is there scope to for that to significantly go up to say 10% or higher and uh, how have you seen the international traffic on the digital side? It, it's grown 25%. Traffic has grown by 25% of in revenue terms at least over last year. Okay, even I suspect even in terms of total number of uh, bed, bed days, that means in terms of volume of patients also has grown by 25% over the same quarter last year and 11% over the last quarter itself. And then do keep in mind, this is, you know, 12% of our total business, which of Afghanistan is down to zero. I mean, if you assume that coming back to normalcy, I mean, this would have been an increase of, uh, you know, 30 odd percent over last year, or more, in fact. So, um, you know, I mean, where does this train stop? I think we haven't even crashed the tip of the iceberg. You know, this should continue, in my mind, uh, much at a significantly higher pace than the rest of the hospital growth. Got it, got it. And the 2600 bed expansion that we have, can you just give some uh, idea in terms of how much can come in the next six months and how much uh, in 25? But 300 beds should come in by end of FY24, current fiscal year. FY25, towards the end, you will have another 350 beds of Nanavati coming. Then Mohali, another 200 beds. When is that? Again, same time uh, uh, next year. And Gurgaon, same time next year. So you have about a thousand beds coming in the next one year. Thirteen hundred, in fact. Eight hundred nineteen beds. Sorry. So three hundred by the end of this year, and another eight hundred to nine hundred by the end of next year, right? Yeah, it's on the presentation on the website. You can see it. I mean, uh, it's a quarter by quarter expense and date of commissioning. Oh, okay. Uh, and just one last data point, uh, you know, you said the institutional RCOB uh, obviously has improved significantly. So now where does the gap between institutional and non-institutional RCOB lie? Roughly, what would be the gap? 85%. Somebody had asked the question earlier, 85%. If for uh, institutional it's 100, for non-institutional 185. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Alankar Garude from Kotak Institutional Equity. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so you mentioned about uh, uh, expecting to make some announcements on the expansion bit uh, shortly. So just wanted to check uh, when it comes to different expansion models, like say between partnered, built to suit, uh, ONM and acquisitions, uh, do we have any specific preference? No, I mean acquisitions are you know, at the right price or the, this thing, but otherwise built to suit uh, in the sense uh, the asset light is very good. Well, we don't like green fields. Understood. Okay. 
and uh, on that point uh, on this care acquisition you have been providing regular updates uh, including one yesterday night now on one hand appeal is reserved for orders and on the other hand blackstone seems to have announced the acquisition at least as per media articles so not sure what to make out of this uh, can you please help elaborate on uh, the current situation i mean the situation is what it is we uh, need a people high court now so the high court to decide understood okay and uh, one final question <laughs> I, i can't uh, uh, give you any opinion on that na i mean for the judge to say true okay and uh, abhay one final question now when it comes to some of these allied services we are into diagnostics um, uh, then at home uh, mm-hmm. but we have seen some of the other hospital chains uh, uh, doing far more as far as some of these allied healthcare services is concerned uh getting into pharmacies then insurance uh, uh diagnostics in a maybe a bigger way so maybe in future not immediately uh, okay. but in future are we open to uh, being more aggressive on some of these allied services i am open to anything and everything in the healthcare business okay which others have succeeded in philosophically we don't like to do pioneering things when they succeed we will study we will learn from their mistakes and we will gain confidence from what they got right and then we will do it better like we do okay so anybody does it i'm very open to doing those things but let somebody else do it uh, uh, you know successfully first i mean there are more than enough examples in front of you where people have you know jumped into a situation and got it wrong and that's not a game we play that's not what we good at to be honest fair enough okay that's it from my side thank you thank you the next question is from the line of amit kavani so as an industrial investor please go ahead hi hi abhay thank you for taking my call my first question is that i don't know if it's already been asked or and have you answered it but the uh, revision impact on the institutional business can you tell us what it is expected to be in the december quarter and march quarter i have no idea what is expected to be because they haven't uh, uh, you know take us as into confidence on that uh, so far the impact has been 5% of our pop uh, of the psu business but uh, we have absolutely no clue uh, how the government is thinking about it if you know further any wage uh, uh, sorry uh, uh, institutional division as the num- announced basically no we were told we were expecting it this quarter and now yeah. hopefully we are expecting in next quarter but you know I, we don't know when it will come through and how much will it be. okay okay the second question is actually you know when i speak to other hospital companies who are not really in metros they say that the institutional business does not have lower margins than the uh, overall business so right. just trying to understand the kind of uh, uh, you know the difference between them and us is it just because that we are in metros that our uh, we we our non institutional business is higher uh, paying is that the conclusion to reach no no look the the institutional business let's say has a arp of let's say 40000 odd right mhm if the rest of your business for whatever reason has a arp of 40000 or lower okay mm-hmm. then it doesn't impact you does it is right so it is the highest in the industry now why is that you know a lot of players have a arp of 40000 now mm-hmm. that should be a function of two or three things one is that the clinical programs okay they are not doing high end clinical programs like transplants mm-hmm. high end oncology etc 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 they are more medical patients okay their peer mix okay is not very big thing you know they don't have international patients they don't have uh, cash paying patients and insurance patients to that extent and whatever else it is right substitution mm-hmm. of institution is in there so obviously you know for them there is no benefit in uh, you know but so so but but the uh, the question actually is that suppose if someone has a hospital let's say in in ranchi 
which is yeah. like a tier 2 city so uh, will the cghs co- compensation to them be the same as another hospital in you know saket will yeah, almost same yeah, there are charges for in the ncr price and non ncr price but uh, i would say not a great difference a okay, negligible difference maybe the same okay. so ranchi okay. will do it the only thing is ranchi there won't be too many cgh reservations right got it got it got it got it got it. thank you thank you abhay thank, thank you thank you the next question is follow up line from kunal damesha from macquarie please go ahead thank you sir so on the uh, cgh and uh, self pay arco we have said the difference of around 85% uh, can you also quantify what would be the difference for the international patient so if let's say cgh yeah, so, is 100 uh, international patient typically be one and a half times of the of the you know cash and the insurance yeah. uh, you know so so that means domestic patient versus cgh is over domestic to international be one and a half times arco uh so could it be roughly around 250 like uh, if we cgh is 100 cgh is well, do the math na so i'm saying so if, 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 if cgh is 100 that is 185 this is uh, you know 50% more than 185 yeah okay okay perfect 275 and this is these are the numbers for h1 i would say or like more or less this remains the current, current numbers are in numbers current current numbers okay okay and secondly uh, on cghs you said that uh, on institutional you said that we are now taking higher complex mo- uh, procedures that said that so do we have that flexibility uh, uh, you know to choose on the specialty on cghs or some of the institutional business Well, we all inherently do because some of our hospitals have now disengaged, and our hospitals which have engaged are doing don't have those nurses sometimes facilities. Okay. So there's a churn which happens. Okay. So basically, some word of mouth, uh, something you know, more more people. Not word of mouth. Like my socket now only does cardiac and uh, oncology. Has stepped out of CTSs on all other things, etc. That's the main hump. So you start moving towards that. Okay. So we have the flexibility of you know saying no to other specialties. Basically, it's not a question of flexibility. It's a matter of contract. Okay. Okay. Not only that we can't treat patients, right? No, no. We we entered our contract is amended to the, this thing. It's not a flexibility that we have. We have no flexibility for all of it, and you do all of it. Mm-hmm. Can't start cherry okay. picking. Start for whatever arrangement you have. Mm-hmm. Okay. So your, our contract is only for few specialties where we have uh, you know strong base and more complex. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any participants who wish to ask a question at this time, then please press star and one. Ladies and gentlemen, as I know for the questions from the participants, I would now like to hand the conference back to the management for the closing remarks. Thank you, and over to you. So thank you all for coming on to uh, Max Networks uh, Q2 fiscal year 2024 results. We will look forward to seeing you for our next results. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Max Healthcare Institute Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you all for joining us, and you may now disconnect.